Are you serious? Welcome to How to Kill an Hour, the podcast all about tech. My name is Nick Bright. He is Marcus Bronzy. And this is part two in a special all about the life of John McAfee. Now, we heard in part one how <laughs> mad John's life, well, the beginnings of John's life uh, were. We haven't even sunk our teeth into the best bits, the juiciest bits yet. So this is part two. But if you haven't managed to hear part one, uh, I suggest you go back and listen. But if not, Marcus is going to do a lovely quick summary for you. In the first episode, we found out about John being born in the UK, moving over to the US and using his skills as a door-to-door salesman and his high tolerance of drugs to muddle his way through the tech industry. But in this episode, we're about to find out how John's luck changed. The people we have to thank for it aren't even from the US at all. It's all thanks to two brothers from Pakistan in 1986. Now these two brothers were called Amjad Farooq Alvi and Basit Farooq Alvi, and they created a code to prevent copyright infringement on a program that they had made. They weren't trying to destroy anything, they just wanted to see how far their creation would travel. So they even included their names and addresses and telephone numbers in this code as well. And the code said this. Welcome to the dungeon. Beware of this virus. Contact us for vaccination. And that was the first ever computer virus. They named it Brain after their computer services shop in Lahore. Within a year, the phone at the shop was ringing because Brain had infected computers all around the world. And at the time, McAfee had been sober for four years and had security clearance to work on classified voice recognition software at the aerospace arms defense company Lockheed in California. But he came across an article in San Jose Mercury News about the spread of the Pakistani brain virus in the US. And this is where McAfee had the idea that would turn his fortune around. He started McAfee Associates out of his 65 meter square home in Santa Clara. His business plan? create an antivirus program and give it away on bulletin boards for free. McAfee didn't want users to pay because his real aim was to get them to think the software was so necessary that they'd install it at their computers at work. That feels real similar to the whole free subscription, all you have to do is pay for shipping business he had earlier on in his life, right? Yeah, yeah. He's, he, there's a pattern emerging. It is. It's, it's a good system. It's a very good system. Uh, And they did. It worked. Within five years, half of the Fortune 100 companies were running McAfee's antivirus software and they felt compelled to pay the business license fee, which was a lot of money. By 1990, McAfee was making $5 million or £3.2 million a year with few overheads and little investment. The idea around antivirus software was that you never knew what would happen. So just like insurance, people wanted to pay just in case. Which comedian calls it just in in case shit? It shouldn't be insurance. Chris Chris Rock. Yeah, that's it. Chris. It's true though, isn't it? It's in case shit. Yeah, and and his whole thing is like, shouldn't I get some of my money back if shit doesn't happen? (laughs) That's how he ends the, the, the bit. He's like, you know, so it's in case shit. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? Yeah. When I go on holiday, say, for example, and I get a, a rental car, I'm like, I want to be able to crash this into a wall or drive it off a cliff and I don't want to have to pay anything. Can I have that insurance, please? Yeah, me and you are different then because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm very much like, what's the cheapest insurance you've got? And I'll take my chances. Really? That's, that's where I'm at with this. And, and like when it comes to like insurance for other stuff, like I've got home and contents insurance and all of that because you kind of, you don't have to, but obviously yeah. you don't want to get burgled and yeah. lose all your stuff. And then like I've got car insurance because you have to, it's, it's a legal requirement. <laughs> but then like all the like other stuff, I'm like, nah, you know, like <laughs> I, right. I'll just take my chances, you know? <laughs> Fair enough. I just feel like personally, the one day that I don't do it will be the day that everything goes bad. Do you know what I mean? Listen, it's it's more exciting. This is the way to live life. (laughs) Living life on edge. Don't listen to me. Yeah. John McAfee went real haywire with this idea because the more energy he pumped into it, the better return he got. He even went a little bit Ghostbusters and bought an eight meter Winnebago, loaded it with computers and announced he had formed the first antivirus pandemic unit. And when he got a call from someone experiencing computer problems in the San Jose area, he drove to the site and searched for virus residue. 
<laughs> I love the fact that like someone's calling him. Like, who are you going to call? John McGuffey. <laughs> Trust me. He <laughs> turned up at your house. Can you imagine you turn up at your house? I hear there's a problem in your house. He lets you in and he's like, I'm just looking for virus residue. He like, go, he like looks at the computer and strokes it. Do you know what I mean? Something's not right here. <laughs> strokes right? the computer and then yeah. like licks his fingers. Yeah, and he's like, what's this sticky, salty residue you on an XX website? And um, yeah. Oh, uh, fuck again again yeah, <laughs> yeah happened again <laughs> but the more scared people were the better his software worked he even went on telly saying viruses were causing so much damage that some computer companies were near collapse from financial loss if that's not enough he wrote a book underlying the danger of viruses and that was called computer viruses worms data diddlers killer programs and other threats to your system Data diddlers, yeah? I mean, that's all of that sounds dangerous apart from the diddling bit. Yeah, I know, right? It's like... <laughs> Viruses, worms, killer programs, threats to your system. Data diddlers! Yay! Yay! Sounds, like, sounds like it should be on CBeebies. It's like a new coding program for kids. On today's episode of Data Diddlers, we're going to be learning about hashtags. <laughs> right. He worked out the more fear there was, the more McAfee antivirus software would grow. And in 1992, McAfee told almost every major news network and newspaper that the recently discovered virus called Michelangelo was a huge threat and he believed it would destroy up to 5 million computers. At the time, things went well with McAfee. He even wrote in an email describing how things were going in his business. And it went like this. My business increased tenfold in the two months following the stories and six months later, our revenues were 50 times greater and we had captured the lion's share of the antivirus market. That's him smoking a big cigar, by the way. Because <laughs> he's rich. 50 times greater. That's raking big. That's in. big. Yeah, raking it in. And again, giving it away for free, causing a bit of a scare and it's because it's virus software he doesn't need to like keep it in a warehouse anywhere so it's digital assets so it's 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 fantastic man he's making money hand over fist or should we say cigar over cocaine or dmt or whatever it is (laughs) so again the sales of his software spiked but check this nick he said five million computers were going to be affected by this virus right only tens of thousands of infections were reported of the michelangelo virus and you know what i've clocked now That's a win-win for him. Because if only 10,000 infections were reported, he can be like, yep, my virus software did its job. Did its job. And if 6 million computers or 8 million computers got hit, he would be like, should have got my antivirus software, shouldn't you? Yeah. Wow. Set himself up nicely. And in October 1992, his finances reflected that because the company debuted on NASDAQ and his shares were suddenly worth $80 million. $80 million, bro. Or 51 million pounds. Crazy, right? That is like, especially because this geezer, when you think about it, that that how the the odds were against him and how much of a loser he was, the fact he's turned this around gives everybody hope, man. 51 milli. 51 milli. Look, get your sales technique right. Create enough fear and and the money just seems to come to you. And I think this is where we reach the glory years for John McAfee. Because from here... Till around the year 2000 or mid 2000s john had it all outwardly he seemed to lead a traditional life with his second wife judy he was a seasoned businessman and startups turned to him for advice stanford graduate school of business wrote two case studies highlighting his strategies is it one for the virus software one for the magazines he was recently he was regularly invited to lecture at the school and he was awarded an honorary doctorate from roanoke college in the year 2000 he even started a yoga institute near his 9000 meter square mansion in the colorado rockies and wrote four books about spirituality even after his marriage fell apart in 2002 he was a respectable citizen who donated computers to schools and took out newspaper ads in disencouraging drug use 
But as he neared retirement age in the late 2000s, he started to feel as though he was deluding himself. His properties, cars and planes had become a burden and he realised he didn't want the traditional rich man's life anymore. And perhaps he couldn't if he wanted to anyway, because in 2008, the economic collapse hit him hard and he couldn't really afford to maintain his lifestyle. By 2009, he'd auctioned off almost everything he'd owned, including more than 400 hectares of land in Hawaii and the private airport that he'd built in New Mexico. He was trying in part to deter people from suing him as well on the assumption that he had deep pockets because he was already facing a lawsuit from a man who tripped on his property in New Mexico and another suit alleged that he was responsible for the death of someone who crashed during a lesson at his flight school that he had founded. Why are people like that for, bruv? (laughs) <laughs> why are people like that how can you try and sue someone for that listen in the states i swear there is a career to be made out of just suing people like e- even people that are getting sued yeah. counter sue don't they, they, they yeah. that's like a big thing in the states it's like there's there's so much suing going on i don't know what I, I, it's so hard to follow there's so much like it's but i t- I'm just, how can you sue? I'm just like, all right, I get it. If you walked up to me, slap me in the face, all right, suing you, right? But he founded a school and <laughs> he got a flying school and he got sued for it. So you're trying to tell me if you help with anything, right? That's it, Nick. Um, you actually founded that charity there that made that little school for young people that uh, to help young people get jobs. And I tripped over one of the steps outside it, suing you. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Where it's there's blame, there's a claim, my friend. A hundred percent, yeah. So John McAfee figured, look, if I'm out of the country, I'm not a target. And he knew that should he lose a case, it would be harder for the plaintiffs to collect the money if he wasn't around. So he took off. And that's where things went from Hollywood to horrible. Drugs, guns, privately funded armies and death are all to come in the next episode of How to Kill an Hour. Jeez, come on. Hollywood to horrible. See, you did that. Award-winning bit of script. Podcast awards, just take note. Anyway, uh, this podcast created by Marcus Bronzy and Nick Bright, produced by Billy Wright, sound design by James Sloan and listened to by you. We'll catch you on the next one, part three, the story of John McAfee. <laughs>